Christ had entered the world as Satan's destroyer and the redeemer of the captives bound by his power, he would leave an example in his own victorious life for man to follow and thus overcome the temptations of Satan. As soon as Christ entered the wilderness of temptation, his visage changed. The glory and splendor which were reflected from the throne of God in his countenance when the heavens opened before him and the Father's voice acknowledged him as his Son, in whom he was well pleased, were now gone. The weight of the sins of the world was pressing upon his soul, and his countenance expressed unutterable sorrow, a depth of anguish that fallen man had never realized. He felt the overwhelming tide of woe that deluged the world. He realized the strength of indulged appetite and unholy passion which controlled the world and had brought upon man inexpressible suffering. The indulgence of appetite had been increasing and strengthening with every successive generation since Adam's transgression until the race was so feeble in moral power that they could not overcome in their own strength. Christ, in behalf of the race, was to overcome appetite by standing the most powerful test upon this point. He was to tread the path of temptation alone, and there must be none to help him, none to comfort or uphold him. Alone he was to wrestle with the powers of darkness. As in his human strength man could not resist the power of Satan's temptations, Jesus volunteered to undertake the work and to bear the burden for man and overcome the power of appetite in his behalf. In man's behalf, he must show self-denial, perseverance, and firmness of principle, paramount to the gnawing pangs of hunger. He must show a power of control stronger than hunger and even death. When Christ bore the test of temptation upon the point of appetite, he did not stand in beautiful Eden, as did Adam, with the light and love of God seen in everything his eye rested upon. But he was in a barren, desolate wilderness, surrounded with wild beasts. Everything around him was repulsive. With these surroundings, he fasted forty days and forty nights, and in those days he did eat nothing. He was emaciated through long fasting and felt the keenest sense of hunger. His visage was indeed marred more than the sons of men. Christ thus entered upon his life of conflict to overcome the mighty foe in bearing the very test which Adam failed to endure that through successful conflict he might break the power of Satan and redeem the race from the disgrace of the fall. All was lost when Adam yielded to the power of appetite, the Redeemer in whom both the human and the divine were united stood in Adam's place and endured a terrible fast of nearly six weeks. The length of this fast is the strongest evidence of the great sinfulness of debased appetite and the power it has upon the human family. The humanity of Christ reached to the very depths of human wretchedness and identified itself with the weaknesses and necessities of fallen man while his divine nature grasped the eternal. His work in bearing the guilt of man's transgression was not to give him license to continue to violate the law of God, for transgression made man a debtor to the law, and Christ himself was paying this debt by his own suffering. The trials and sufferings of Christ were to impress man with a sense of his great sin in breaking the law of God and to bring him to repentance and obedience to that law and through obedience to acceptance with God. He would impute his righteousness to man and so raise him in moral value with God that his efforts to keep the divine law would be acceptable. Christ's work was to reconcile man to God through his human nature and God to man through his divine nature. As soon as the long fast of Christ commenced, Satan was at hand with his temptations. He came to Christ enshrouded in light, claiming to be one of the angels from the throne of God, sent upon an errand of mercy to sympathize with him and to relieve him of his suffering condition. 
He tried to make Christ believe that God did not require him to pass through the self-denial and sufferings he anticipated, that he had been sent from heaven to bear to him the message that God only designed to prove his willingness to endure. Satan told Christ that he was to set his feet in the blood-stained path, but not to travel it, that like Abraham, he was tested to show his perfect obedience. He also stated that he was the angel that stayed the hand of Abraham as the knife was raised to slay Isaac, and that he had now come to save his life, that it was not necessary for him to endure this painful hunger and death from starvation, and that he would help him bear the work in the plan of salvation. The Son of God turned from all these artful temptations and was steadfast in his purpose to carry out in every particular, in the spirit and in the very letter, the plan which had been devised for the redemption of the fallen race. But Satan had manifold temptations prepared to ensnare Christ and obtain advantage of him. If he failed in one temptation, he would try another. He thought he would succeed because Christ had humbled himself as a man. He flattered himself that his assumed character as one of the heavenly angels could not be discerned. He feigned to doubt the divinity of Christ because of his emaciated appearance and unpleasant surroundings. Christ knew that in taking the nature of man, he would not be equal in appearance to the angels of heaven. Satan urged that if he was indeed the Son of God, he should give him evidence of his exalted character. He approached Christ with temptations upon appetite. He had overcome Adam upon this point, and he had controlled his descendants, and through indulgence of appetite had led them to provoke God by iniquity until their crimes were so great that the Lord destroyed them from off the earth by the waters of the flood." Under Satan's direct temptations, the children of Israel suffered appetite to control reason, and they were, through indulgence, led to commit grievous sins which awakened the wrath of God against them, and they fell in the wilderness. He thought that he should be successful in overcoming Christ with the same temptation. Satan told Christ that one of the exalted angels had been exiled to the earth, that his appearance indicated that instead of his being the king of heaven, he was the fallen angel, and that this explained his emaciated and distressed appearance. He then called the attention of Christ to his own attractive appearance, clothed with light and strong in power. He claimed to be a messenger direct from the throne of heaven and asserted that he had a right to demand of Christ evidences of his being the Son of God. Satan would fain disbelieve, if he could, the words that came from heaven to the Son of God at his baptism. He determined to overcome Christ and, if possible, make his own kingdom and life secure. His first temptation to Christ was upon appetite. He had upon this point almost entire control of the world, and his temptations were so adapted to the circumstances and surroundings of Christ that his temptations upon appetite were almost overpowering. Christ could have worked a miracle in his own behalf, but this would not have been in accordance with the plan of salvation. The many miracles in the life of Christ show his power to work miracles for the benefit of suffering humanity. By a miracle of mercy, he fed 5,000 at once with five loaves and two small fishes. Therefore, he had the power to work a miracle and satisfy his own hunger. Satan flattered himself that he could lead Christ to doubt the words spoken from heaven at his baptism. If he could tempt him to question his sonship and doubt the truth of the words spoken by his father, he would gain a great victory. He found Christ in the desolate wilderness without companions, without food, and in actual suffering. His surroundings were most melancholy and repulsive. Satan suggested to Christ that God would not leave his son in this condition of want and suffering. He hoped to shake the confidence of Christ in his father, who had permitted him to be brought into this condition of extreme suffering in the desert, where the feet of man had never trod. Satan hoped that he could insinuate doubts as to his father's love, which would find lodgment in the mind of Christ, and that under the force of despondency and extreme hunger, 
he would exert his miraculous power in his own behalf and take himself out of the hands of his heavenly Father. This was indeed a temptation to Christ, but he cherished it not for a moment. He did not for a single moment doubt his heavenly Father's love, although he was bowed down with inexpressible anguish. Satan's temptations, though skillfully devised, did not move the integrity of God's dear Son. His abiding confidence in his Father could not be shaken. Jesus did not condescend to explain to his enemy how he was the Son of God and in what manner as such he was to act. In an insulting, taunting manner, Satan referred to the present weakness and the distressed appearance of Christ in contrast with his own strength and glory. He taunted Christ with being a poor representative of the angels, much less of their exalted commander, the acknowledged king in the royal courts, and that his present appearance indicated that he was forsaken of God and man. He said that if Christ was indeed the Son of God, the monarch of heaven, he had power equal with God, and he could give him evidence of this and relieve his hunger by working a miracle by changing the stone just at his feet into bread. Satan promised that if Christ would do this, he would at once yield his claims of superiority and that the contest between himself and Christ should there be forever ended. Christ did not appear to notice the reviling taunts of Satan. He was not provoked to give him proofs of his power, but meekly bore his insults without retaliation. The words spoken from heaven at his baptism were precious evidence to him that his father approved the steps he was taking in the plan of salvation as man's substitute and surety. The opening heavens and the descent of the heavenly dove were assurances that his Father would unite his power in heaven with that of his Son upon the earth to rescue man from the control of Satan, and that God accepted the effort of Christ to link earth to heaven and finite man to the infinite God. The tokens received from his Father were inexpressibly precious to the Son of God through all his severe sufferings and the terrible conflict with the rebel chief. And while enduring the test of God in the wilderness and through his entire ministry, he had nothing to do in convincing Satan of his power and that he was the Savior of the world. Satan had sufficient evidence of his exalted station, his unwillingness to ascribe to Jesus the honor due to him and to manifest submission as a subordinate ripened into rebellion against God and shut him out of heaven. It was not part of the mission of Christ to exercise his divine power for his own benefit to relieve himself of suffering. This he had volunteered to take upon himself. He had condescended to take man's nature, and he was to suffer the inconveniences, ills, and afflictions of the human family. He was not to perform miracles on his own account. He came to save others. The object of his mission was to bring blessings, hope, and life to the afflicted and oppressed. He was to bear the burdens and griefs of suffering humanity. Although Christ was suffering the keenest pangs of hunger, he withstood the temptation. He repulsed Satan with the same scripture he had given Moses to repeat to rebellious Israel when their diet was restricted and they were clamoring for flesh meats in the wilderness. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In this declaration, and also by his example, Christ would show man that hunger for temporal food was not the greatest calamity that could befall him. Satan flattered our first parents that eating the fruit which God had forbidden them would bring to them great good and would ensure them against death the very opposite of the truth which God had declared to them. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. If Adam had been obedient, he would have known neither want, sorrow, nor death. If the people who lived before the flood had been obedient to the word of God, they would not have perished by the waters of the flood. If the Israelites had been obedient to the words of God, he would have bestowed upon them special blessings but they fell in consequence of the indulgence of appetite and passion. 
they would not be obedient to the words of God. Indulgence of perverted appetite led them into numerous and grievous sins. If they had made the requirements of God their first consideration and their physical wants secondary, in submission to God's choice of proper food for them, not one of them would have fallen in the wilderness. They would have been established in the goodly land of Canaan, a holy, happy people with not a feeble one in all their tribes. The Savior of the world became sin for the race. In becoming man's substitute, Christ did not manifest his power as a son of God, but ranked himself among the sons of men. He was to bear the trial of temptation as a man in man's behalf under the most trying circumstances and leave an example of faith and perfect trust in his heavenly Father. Christ knew that his Father would supply him food when it would be for his glory. He would not in this severe ordeal when hunger pressed him beyond measure prematurely diminish one particle of the trial allotted to him by exercising his divine power. Fallen man, when brought into straitened places, could not have the power to work miracles in his own behalf, to save himself from pain or anguish, or to give himself victory over his enemies. It was the purpose of God to test and prove the race and give them an opportunity to develop character by bringing them frequently into trying positions to test their faith and confidence in his love and power. The life of Christ was a perfect pattern. He was ever, by his example and teachings, learning man that God was his dependence and that in him should be his faith and firm trust. Christ knew that Satan was a liar from the beginning and it required strong self-control to listen to the propositions of this insulting deceiver and not instantly rebuke his bold assumptions. Satan was expecting that the Son of God would, in his extreme weakness and agony of spirit, give him an opportunity to obtain advantage over him by provoking him to engage in controversy with him. He designed to pervert the words of Christ and claim advantage and call to his aid his fallen angels to use their utmost power to prevail against and overcome him. The Savior of the world had no controversy with Satan who was expelled from heaven because he was no longer worthy of a place there. He who could influence the angels of God against their supreme ruler and against his son, their beloved commander, and enlist their sympathy for himself was capable of any deception. Four thousand years he had been warring against the government of God and had lost none of his skill or power to tempt and deceive. Because man fallen could not overcome Satan with his human strength, Christ came from the royal courts of heaven to help him with his human and divine strength combined. Christ knew that Adam in Eden with his superior advantages might have withstood the temptations of Satan and conquered him. He also knew that it was not possible for man out of Eden, separated from the light and love of God since the fall, to resist the temptations of Satan in his own strength. In order to bring hope to man and save him from complete ruin, he humbled himself to take man's nature, that with his divine power combined with the human he might reach man where he is. He obtained for the fallen sons and daughters of Adam that strength which it is impossible for them to gain for themselves, that in his name they might overcome the temptations of Satan. The exalted Son of God in assuming humanity draws himself near to man by standing as the sinner's substitute. He identifies himself with the sufferings and afflictions of men. He was tempted in all points as man is tempted that he might know how to succor those who should be tempted. Christ overcame on the sinner's behalf. Jacob in the night vision saw earth connected with heaven by a ladder reaching to the throne of God. He saw the angels of God clothed with garments of heavenly brightness passing down from heaven and up to heaven upon this shining ladder. 
the bottom of this ladder rested upon the earth, while the top of it reached to the highest heavens and rested upon the throne of Jehovah. The brightness from the throne of God beamed down upon this ladder and reflected a light of inexpressible glory upon the earth. This ladder represented Christ who had opened the communication between earth and heaven. In Christ's humiliation, he descended to the very depths of human woe in sympathy and pity for fallen man, which was represented to Jacob by one end of the ladder resting upon the earth, while the top of the ladder reaching into heaven represents the divine power of Christ grasping the infinite and thus linking earth to heaven and finite man to the infinite God. Through Christ, the communication is open between God and man. Angels may pass to and fro from heaven to earth with messages of love to fallen man and to minister unto those who shall be heirs of salvation. It is through Christ alone that the heavenly messengers minister to men. Adam and Eve in Eden were placed under most favorable circumstances. It was their privilege to hold communion with God and angels. They were without the condemnation of sin. The light of God and angels was with them and around about them. The author of their existence was their teacher, but they fell beneath the power and temptations of the artful foe. Four thousand years had Satan been at work against the government of God, and he had obtained strength and experience from determined practice. Fallen men had not the advantages of Adam and Eden. They had been separating from God for four thousand years. The wisdom to understand and power to resist the temptations of Satan had become less and less until Satan seemed to reign triumphant in the earth. Appetite and passion, the love of the world, and presumptuous sins were the great branches of evil out of which every species of crime, violence, and corruption grew. Satan was defeated in his object to overcome Christ upon the point of appetite. And here in the wilderness, Christ achieved a victory in behalf of the race upon the point of appetite, making it possible for man in all future time in his name to overcome the strength of appetite on his own behalf. But Satan was not willing to cease his efforts until he had tried every means to obtain a victory over the world's Redeemer. He knew that with himself all was at stake whether he or Christ should be victor in the contest. And in order to awe Christ with his superior strength, he carried him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and continued to beset him with temptations. He again demanded of Christ that if he was indeed the Son of God, to give him evidence by casting himself from the dizzy height upon which he had placed him. He urged Christ to show his confidence in the preserving care of his Father by casting himself down from the temple. In Satan's first temptation upon the point of appetite, he had tried to insinuate doubts in regard to God's love and care for Christ as his son by presenting his surroundings and his hunger as an evidence that he was not in favor with God. He was unsuccessful in this. He next tried to take advantage of the faith and perfect trust Christ had shown in his heavenly Father to urge him to presumption. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus promptly answered, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The sin of presumption lies close beside the virtue of perfect faith and confidence in God. Satan flattered himself that he could take advantage of the humanity of Christ to urge him over the line of trust to presumption. Upon this point, many souls are wrecked. Satan tried to deceive Christ through flattery. He admitted that he was right in the wilderness in his faith and confidence that God was his Father under the most trying circumstances. He then urged Christ to give him one more proof of his entire dependence upon God, one more evidence of his faith that he was the Son of God by casting himself from the temple. 
He told Christ that if he was indeed the Son of God, he had nothing to fear, for angels were at hand to uphold him. Satan gave evidence that he understood the Scriptures by the use he made of them. The Redeemer of the world wavered not from his integrity and showed that he had perfect faith in his Father's promised care. He would not put the faithfulness and love of his Father to a needless trial, although he was in the hands of an enemy and placed in a position of extreme difficulty and peril. He would not at Satan's suggestion tempt God by presumptuously experimenting on his providence. Satan had brought in scripture which seemed appropriate for the occasion, hoping to accomplish his designs by making the application to our Savior at this special time. Christ knew that God could indeed bear him up if he had required him to throw himself from the temple, but to do this unbidden and to experiment upon his Father's protecting care and love, because dared by Satan to do so, would not show his strength of faith. Satan was well aware that if Christ could be prevailed upon unbidden by his Father to fling himself from the temple to prove his claim to his Heavenly Father's protecting care, he would in the very act show the weakness of his human nature. Christ came off victor in the second temptation. He manifested perfect confidence and trust in his Father during his severe conflict with the powerful foe. Our Redeemer in the victory here gained has left man a perfect pattern showing him that his only safety is in firm trust an unwavering confidence in God in all trials and perils. He refused to presume upon the mercy of his Father by placing himself in peril that would make it necessary for his heavenly Father to display his power to save him from danger. This would be forcing providence on his own account, and he would not then leave for his people a perfect example of faith and firm trust in God. Satan's object in tempting Christ was to lead him to daring presumption and to show human weakness that would not make him a perfect pattern for his people. He thought that should Christ fail to bear the test of his temptations, there could be no redemption for the race, and his power over them would be complete. The humiliation and agonizing sufferings of Christ in the wilderness of temptation were for the race. In Adam, all was lost by transgression. Through Christ was man's only hope of restoration to the favor of God. Man had separated himself at such distance from God by transgression of his law that he could not humiliate himself before God in any degree proportionate to the magnitude of his sin. The Son of God could fully understand the aggravating sins of the transgressor and in his sinless character he alone could make an acceptable atonement for man in suffering the agonizing sense of his father's displeasure. The sorrow and anguish of the Son of God for the sins of the world were proportionate to his divine excellence and purity as well as to the magnitude of the offense. Christ was our example in all things. As we see his humiliation in the long trial and fast to overcome the temptation of appetite in our behalf, we are to learn how to overcome when we are tempted. If the power of appetite is so strong upon the human family and its indulgence so fearful that the Son of God subjected himself to such a test, how important that we feel the necessity of having appetite under the control of reason. Our Savior fasted nearly six weeks that he might gain for man the victory upon the point of appetite. How can professed Christians with enlightened consciences and with Christ before them as their pattern yield to the indulgence of those appetites which have an enervating influence upon the mind and body? It is a painful fact that habits of self-gratification at the expense of health and moral power are at the present time holding a large share of the Christian world in the bonds of slavery. Many who profess godliness do not inquire into the reason for Christ's long period of fasting and suffering in the wilderness. His anguish was not so much from the pangs of hunger 
as from his sense of the fearful result of the indulgence of appetite and passion upon the race. He knew that appetite would be man's idol and would lead him to forget God and would stand directly in the way of his salvation. Our Savior showed perfect confidence that his heavenly Father would not suffer him to be tempted above what he should give him strength to endure, but would bring him off conquer if he patiently bore the test to which he was subjected. Christ had not of his own will placed himself in danger. God had suffered Satan for the time being to have this power over his son. Satan knew that if he preserved his integrity in this extremely trying position, an angel of God would be sent to relieve him if there was no other way. He had taken humanity and was a representative of the race. Satan saw that he prevailed nothing with Christ in his second great temptation, and the devil, taking him up into an high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. In the first two great temptations, Satan had not revealed his true purposes or his character. He claimed to be an exalted messenger from the courts of heaven, but he now throws off his disguise. In a panoramic view, he presented before Christ all the kingdoms of the world in the most attractive light, while he claimed to be the prince of the world. This last temptation was the most alluring of the three. Satan knew that Christ's life must be one of sorrow, hardship, and conflict, and he thought he could take advantage of this fact to bribe Christ to yield his integrity. Satan brought all his strength to bear upon this last temptation, for this last effort was to decide his destiny as to who should be victor. He claimed the world as his dominion and that he was the prince of the power of the air. He bore Jesus to the top of an exceeding high mountain and then in a panoramic view presented before him all the kingdoms of the world that had been so long under his dominion and offered them to him in one great gift. He told Christ that he could come into possession of all these kingdoms without suffering or peril. Satan promises to yield his scepter and dominion and to make Christ the rightful ruler for one favor from him. All he requires in return for making over to him the kingdoms of the world that day presented before him is that Christ shall do him homage as to a superior. The eye of Jesus for a moment rested upon the glory presented before him, but he turned away and refused to look upon the entrancing spectacle. He would not endanger his steadfast integrity by dallying with the tempter. When Satan solicited homage, Christ's divine indignation was aroused, and he could no longer tolerate his blasphemous assumption or even permit him to remain in his presence. Here Christ exercised his divine authority and commanded Satan to desist. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Satan in his pride and arrogance had declared himself to be the rightful and permanent ruler of the world, the possessor of all its riches and glory, claiming homage of all who lived in it as though he had created the world and all things that were therein. Said he to Christ, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. He endeavored to make a special contract with Christ, to make over to him at once the whole of his claim if he would worship him. This insult to the Creator moved the indignation of the Son of God to rebuke and dismiss him. Satan had flattered himself in his first temptation that he had so well concealed his true character and purposes that Christ did not recognize him as a fallen rebel chief whom he had conquered and expelled from heaven. The words of dismissal from Christ, Get thee hence, Satan, evidence that he was known from the first, and that all his deceptive arts had been unsuccessful upon the Son of God. 
Satan knew that if Jesus should die to redeem man, his power would end after a season and he would be destroyed. Therefore, it was his studied plan to prevent, if possible, the completion of the great work which had been commenced by the Son of God. If the plan of man's redemption should fail, he would retain the kingdom which he then claimed, and if he should succeed, he flattered himself that he would reign in opposition to the God of heaven. When Jesus left heaven and there left his power and glory, Satan exulted. He thought that the Son of God was placed in his power. The temptation took so easily with the holy pair in Eden that he hoped with his satanic cunning and power to overthrow even the Son of God and thereby save his life and kingdom. If he could tempt Jesus to depart from the will of God as he had done in his temptation with Adam and Eve, then his object would be gained. The time was to come when Jesus should redeem the possession of Satan by giving his own life, and after a season all in heaven and earth should submit to him. He was steadfast. He chose this life of suffering, this ignominious death, and in the way appointed by his father to become a lawful ruler of the kingdoms of the earth and have them given into his hands as an everlasting possession. Satan also will be given into his hands to be destroyed by death, never more to annoy Jesus nor the saints in glory. Jesus said to this wily foe, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Satan had asked Christ to give him evidence that he was the Son of God, and he had in this instance the proof he had asked. At the divine command of Christ, he was compelled to obey. He was repulsed and silenced. He had no power to withstand the peremptory dismissal. He was compelled without another word instantly to desist and leave the world's Redeemer. The hateful presence of Satan was withdrawn. The contest was ended. With inestimable suffering, Christ's victory in the wilderness was as complete as was the failure of Adam, and for a season he stood freed from the presence of his powerful adversary and his legions of angels. Christ's temptation ended. After Satan had ended his temptations, he departed from Jesus for a little season. The foe was conquered, but the conflict had been long and exceedingly trying, and Christ was exhausted and fainting. He fell upon the ground as though dying. Heavenly angels who had bowed before him in the royal courts and who had been with intense and painful interest watching their love commander and with amazement had witnessed the terrible contest he had endured with Satan now came and ministered unto him. They prepared him food and strengthened him, for he lay as one dead. Angels were filled with amazement and awe, as they knew the world's Redeemer was passing through inexpressible suffering to achieve the redemption of man. He who was equal with God in the royal courts was before them emaciated from nearly six weeks of fasting. Solitary and alone, he had been pursued by the rebel chief who had been expelled from heaven. He had endured a more close and severe test than would ever be brought to bear upon man. The warfare with the power of darkness had been long and intensely trying to Christ's human nature in his weak and suffering condition. The angels brought messages of love and comfort from the Father and the assurance that all heaven triumphed in the full and entire victory he had gained in behalf of man. The cost of the redemption of the race can never be fully realized until the redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer by the throne of God. As they have capacity to appreciate the value of immortal life and the eternal reward, they will swell the song of victory and immortal triumph, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature, says John, which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power 
be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Although Satan had failed in his strongest efforts and most powerful temptations, yet he had not given up all hope that he might at some future time be successful in his efforts. He looked forward to the period of Christ's ministry when he should have opportunities to try his artifices against him. Satan laid his plans to blind the understanding of the Jews, God's chosen people, that they should not discern in Christ the world's Redeemer. He thought he could fill their hearts with envy, jealousy, and hatred against the Son of God so that they would not receive him but would make his life upon earth as bitter as possible. Satan held a council with his angels as to the course they should pursue to prevent the people from having faith in Christ as a Messiah whom the Jews had so long been anxiously expecting. He was disappointed and enraged that he had prevailed nothing against Jesus in the manifold temptations in the wilderness. He thought if he could inspire in the hearts of Christ's own people unbelief as to his being the promised one, he might discourage Jesus in his mission and secure the Jews as his agents to carry out his purposes. Satan comes to man with his temptations as an angel of light as he came to Christ. He has been working to bring man into a condition of physical and moral weakness that he may easily overcome him and then triumph over his ruin. And he has been successful in tempting man to indulge appetite regardless of the result. He well knows that it is impossible for man to discharge his obligations to God and to his fellow men while he impairs the faculties which God has given him. The brain is the capital of the body. If the perceptive faculties become benumbed through intemperance of any kind, eternal things are not discerned. Christian Temperance God gives man no permission to violate the laws of his being, but man, through yielding to Satan's temptations to indulge in temperance, brings the higher faculties in subjection to the animal appetites and passions, and when these gain the ascendancy, man, who was created a little lower than the angels with faculties susceptible of the highest cultivation, surrenders to the control of Satan, and he gains easy access to those who are in bondage to appetite. Through intemperance, some sacrifice one half and other two-thirds of their physical, mental, and moral powers and become playthings for the enemy. Those who would have clear minds to discern Satan's devices must have their physical appetites under the control of reason and conscience. The moral and vigorous action of the higher powers of the mind are essential to the perfection of Christian character and the strength or the weakness of the mind has very much to do with our usefulness in this world and with our final salvation. The ignorance that has prevailed in regard to God's law in our physical nature is deplorable. Intemperance of any kind is a violation of the laws of our being. Imbecility is prevailing to a fearful extent. Sin is made attractive by the covering of light which Satan throws over it, and he is well pleased when he can hold the Christian world in their daily habits under the tyranny of custom like the heathen and allow appetite to govern them. If men and women of intelligence have their moral powers benumbed through intemperance of any kind, they are in many of their habits elevated but little above the heathen. Satan is constantly drawing the people from saving light to custom and fashion irrespective of physical, mental, and moral health. The great enemy knows that if appetite and passion predominate, the health of body and strength of intellect are sacrificed upon the altar of self-gratification, and man is brought to speedy ruin. If enlightened intellect holds the reins, controlling the animal propensities and keeping them in subjection to the moral powers, Satan well knows that his power to overcome with his temptations is very small. In our day, people talk of the dark ages and boast of progress, but with this progress, wickedness and crime do not decrease. 
We deplore the absence of natural simplicity and the increase of artificial display. Health, strength, beauty, and long life, which were common in the so-called Dark Ages, are rare now. Nearly everything desirable is sacrificed to meet the demands of fashionable life. A large share of the Christian world have no right to call themselves Christians. Their habits, their extravagance, and general treatment of their own bodies are violations of physical law and contrary to the Bible. They are working out for themselves in their course of life physical suffering and mental and moral feebleness. Through his devices, Satan, in many respects, has made the domestic life one of care and complicated burdens in order to meet the demands of fashion. His purpose in doing this is to keep minds occupied so fully with the things of this life that they can give but little attention to their highest interest. Intemperance in eating and in dressing has so engrossed the minds of the Christian world that they do not take time to become intelligent in regard to the laws of their being that they may obey them. To profess the name of Christ is of but little account if the life does not correspond with the will of God revealed in his word. In the wilderness of temptation, Christ overcame appetite. His example of self-denial and self-control when suffering the gnawing pangs of hunger is a rebuke to the Christian world for their dissipation and gluttony. There is at this time nine times as much money expended for the gratification of appetite and the indulgence of foolish and hurtful lusts as there is given to advance the gospel of Christ. Were Peter upon the earth now, he would exhort the professed followers of Christ to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And Paul would call upon the churches in general to cleanse themselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And Christ would drive from the temple those who were defiled by the use of tobacco, polluting the sanctuary of God by their tobacconized breasts. He would say to these worshipers, as he did to the Jews, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. We would say to such, Your unholy offerings of ejected quids of tobacco defile the temple and are abhorred of God. Your worship is not acceptable, for your bodies, which should be the temple for the Holy Ghost, are defiled. You also rob the treasury of God of thousands of dollars through the indulgence of unnatural appetite. If we would see the standard of virtue and godliness exalted as Christians, we have a work devolving upon us individually to control appetite, the indulgence of which counteracts the force of truth and weakens moral power to resist and overcome temptation. As Christ's followers, we should, in eating and drinking, act from principle. When we obey the injunction of the apostle, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God, thousands of dollars which are now sacrificed upon the altar of hurtful lust will flow into the Lord's treasury, multiplying publications in different languages to be scattered like the leaves of autumn. Missions will be established in other nations, and then will the followers of Christ be indeed the light of the world. The adversary of souls is working in these last days with greater power than ever before to accomplish the ruin of man through the indulgence of appetite and passions. And many who are held by Satan under the power of slavish appetite are the professed followers of Christ. They profess to worship God while appetite is their God. Their unnatural desires for these indulgences are not controlled by reason or judgment. Those who are slaves to tobacco will see their families suffering for the conveniences of life and for necessary food, yet they have not the power of will to forego their tobacco. The clamors of appetite prevail over natural affection, and this brute passion controls them. The cause of Christianity and even humanity would not in any case be sustained if dependent upon those 
in the habitual use of tobacco and liquor. If they had means to use only in one direction, the treasury of God would not be replenished, but they would have their tobacco and liquor, for the tobacco idolater will not deny his appetite for the cause of God. It is impossible for such men to realize the binding claims and holiness of the law of God, for their brain and nerves are deadened by the use of this narcotic. They cannot value the atonement or appreciate the worth of immortal life. The indulgence of fleshly lusts wars against the soul. The apostle in the most impressive language addresses Christians. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. If the body is saturated with liquor and defiled by tobacco, it is not holy and acceptable to God. Satan knows that it cannot be, and for this reason he brings his temptations to bear upon the point of appetite that he may bring us into bondage to this propensity and thus work our ruin. The Jewish sacrifices were all examined with careful scrutiny to see if any blemish was upon them or if they were tainted with disease, and the least defect or impurity was a sufficient reason for the priest to reject them. The offering must be sound and valuable. The apostle has in view the requirements of God upon the Jews in their offerings when he in the most earnest manner appeals to his brethren to present their bodies a living sacrifice. Not a disease decaying offering, but a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. How many come to the house of God in feebleness, and how many come defiled by the indulgence of their own appetite? Those who have degraded themselves by wrong habits when they assemble for the worship of God give forth such emanations from their diseased bodies as to be disgusting to those around them, and how offensive must this be to a pure and holy God. A large proportion of all the infirmities that afflict the human family are the results of their own wrong habits because of their willful ignorance or of their disregard of the light which God has given in relation to the laws of their being. It is not possible for us to glorify God while living in violation of the laws of life. The heart cannot possibly maintain consecration to God while the lustful appetite is indulged. A diseased body and disordered intellect, because of continual indulgences in hurtful lust, make sanctification of the body and spirit impossible. The apostle understood the importance of the healthful conditions of the body for the successful perfection of Christian character. He says, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He mentions the fruit of the Spirit, among which is temperance. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Men and women indulge appetite at the expense of health and their powers of intellect so that they cannot appreciate the plan of salvation. What appreciation can such have of the temptation of Christ in the wilderness and of the victory he gained upon the point of appetite? It is impossible for them to have exalted views of God and to realize the claims of his law. The proposed followers of Christ are forgetful of the great sacrifice made by him on their account. The majesty of heaven, in order to bring salvation within their reach, was smitten, bruised, and afflicted. He became a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. In the wilderness of temptation, he resisted Satan, although the tempter was clothed with the livery of heaven. Christ, although brought to great physical suffering, refused to yield a single point, notwithstanding the most flattering inducements were presented to bribe and influence him to yield his integrity. All this honor, all this riches and glory, said the deceiver, will I give thee if thou wilt only acknowledge my claims. Christ was firm. Oh, where would now be the salvation of the race if Christ had been as weak in moral power as man? 
No wonder that joy filled heaven as the fallen chief left the wilderness of temptation, a conquered foe. Christ has power from his Father to give his divine grace and strength to man, making it possible for us through his name to overcome. There are but few professed followers of Christ who choose to engage with him in the work of resisting Satan's temptations as he resisted and overcame. Professed Christians who enjoy gatherings of gaiety, pleasure, and feasting cannot appreciate the conflict of Christ in the wilderness. This example of their Lord in overcoming Satan is lost to them. This infinite victory which Christ achieved for them in the plan of salvation is meaningless. They have no special interest in the wonderful humiliation of our Savior and the anguish and sufferings he endured for sinful man while Satan was pressing him with his manifold temptations. The scene of trial with Christ in the wilderness was the foundation of the plan of salvation and gives to fallen man the key whereby he in Christ's name may overcome. Many professed Christians look upon this portion of the life of Christ as they would upon a common warfare between two kings and as having no special bearing upon their own life and character. Therefore, the manner of warfare and the wonderful victory gained have but little interest for them. Their perceptive powers are blunted by Satan's artifices so that they cannot discern that he who afflicted Christ in the wilderness determined to rob him of his integrity as the Son of the Infinite is to be their adversary to the end of time. Although he failed to overcome Christ, his power is not weakened over man. All are personally exposed to the temptations that Christ overcame, but strength is provided for them in the all-powerful name of the great conqueror, and all must for themselves individually overcome. Many fall under the very same temptations wherein Satan assailed Christ. Although Christ gained a priceless victory in behalf of man in overcoming the temptations of Satan in the wilderness, this victory will not benefit unless he also gains the victory on his own account. Man now has the advantage over Adam in his warfare with Satan, for he has Adam's experience in disobedience and his consequent fall to warn him to shun his example. Man also has Christ's example in overcoming appetite and the manifold temptations of Satan and in vanquishing the mighty foe upon every point and coming off victor in every contest. If man stumbles and falls under the temptations of Satan, he is without excuse, for he has the disobedience of Adam as a warning and the life of the world's Redeemer as an example of obedience and self-denial, and the promise of Christ that to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. 